Hello, welcome to Convergent Dialogues. This is Xavier Bonilla. On this episode, I am very pleased to bring the conversation I had with Diana Fleischman. Diana is an evolutionary psychologist and associate research professor at the University of New Mexico. She has written on numerous topics, such as on evolution, on mate selection, on disgust, and many other things. Um, in this conversation, we talk about two big topics, I would say. We talk about polyamory, um, and we also talk about eugenics. Eugenics is a topic she's been um, more interested in as of as of late and uh, so it was it was nice to kind of get the full download of her thoughts here she's written a few pieces on it so i was very happy to kind of get into some of the details with her and really get her to um, just expand on all of her thoughts we start the conversation by talking about how evolutionary psychology is a good framework for understanding relationships we talk about uh, patriarchal and matriarchal societies uh, we talk about the history of monogamous and uh, polyamorous relationships and what that looks like. We talk about jealousy and polyamory. We discuss uh, the difficult history of eugenics, decoupling the bad from the good with eugenics, polygenetic scores, um, differences in various uh, places around the world with prenatal care. We talk about some of the contours of polygenetic screening and GWAS studies. Uh, we talk about some of her evolving viewpoints and many other topics. Uh, these topics are obviously controversial in some ways, I think. And But I think what I've come away with in reading her uh, writing and, and talking with her is, um, as you know, she mentions it in the conversation, that, you know, sometimes it's fun to kind of uh, get people worked up. But mostly I think she comes from a space of trying to say, okay, well, how can we understand these ideas? How can we understand them and, and not broadly apply them to people, but how do we talk about them and how do we understand what they could be about? Um, one of the things I've noticed about her is that she's she doesn't shy away from criticism and she'll, if someone presents a good criticism of her arguments, um, she usually will engage with it if it's in good faith. And so it's very respectable for me. Um, and of course, you know, some people do get nervous about some of these topics, but I think it's good that we we have good faith uh, conversations and lots of dialogue on it. As always, you can find this conversation and all other conversations at convergingdialogues.substack.com. I'm also on YouTube, so you can follow, subscribe there. Uh, feel free to share widely as well. And now I bring you Diana Fleischman. I am here with Diana Fleischman. Uh, Diana, thanks so much for uh, coming on the podcast, I'm uh, greatly looking forward to, to talking with you. Hey, nice to be here. Yeah, of course. Uh, so I'll just uh, say that you've uh, done some pretty awesome work on a lot of areas. I'll let you introduce yourself, but um, we have a li nice list of things to to get into. Um, how do you usually now, I guess, tell people your kind of professional or <laughs> academic background or what you currently study? How do you usually kind of tell talk about yourself, I guess, in that way? Well, I was a, an academic for many years, over a decade, uh, at the University of Portsmouth in the UK. And then I left, uh, and now I'm a research associate professor at University of New Mexico. That's kind of a placeholder. So mm -hmm. I still have a, an academic title, but I write. I'm writing a book called How to Train Your Boyfriend. And mm -hmm. I also work for Aporia. I do interviews for them. Um, that's sort of a uh, edgy magazine. <laughs> uh, online magazine that, uh, you know, has, has a variety of interests, including reproductive technology, uh, race, the validity or lack thereof, stuff like that. And, uh, so yeah, I, I write and I, I haven't really been doing much research. I've mostly been uh, writing my book and taking care of my daughter, mm. one out and one on the way. Mm. And I, I left academia cause I couldn't get a job in the same place as my husband. That's one of the pitfalls of, uh, getting in a relationship with another academic because it's very hard to get, mm. they call that two body problem. So yeah. Um, but I, I'm not as, a, I'm not as wedded to the academic creds mm. as I used to be. I'm, mm. I'm quite happy. Mm. Yeah. You, I, I, uh, for, for listeners, you, you are, uh, married to, a uh, uh, previous podcast guest, Jeffrey uh, Miller, who was on the podcast not that long ago. We had a fantastic conversation. Um, 
and it's uh i actually i think i heard about you even before i think you guys were like uh like together in an item i had there's certain people in like evo psych world that kind of like write papers and you kind of know about them and it's like oh okay and then you kind of realize who's together and <laughs> who isn't or whatever so um i think it's always good to give people their their uh do do work and all do do honor for what they do on on their own do you um did a lot of interviews and stuff yeah before i've always been uh i was very lucky in the uk you know at the institution that i was at they were fine with me. I was on a late night show telling dirty jokes. I did interviews about whatever I wanted. I never got any flack for that. I had another friend in the UK who ended up uh, leaving his job because they were literally printing out his tweets and, and reading them to him. I had a lot of freedom at my job and, and nobody really minded what I talked about uh, in oh, public uh, as opposed to you know some American institutions. You can't really do that, especially uh, and, and in the UK, you get tenure or whatever. You're made permanent mm -hmm. after a year. It's hard to get rid of you. Although uh, at another university close to where I was at, University of Southampton, uh, the biology department told me that you had to have special permission to do any interviews and mm. that you were not allowed to talk about uh, animal cloning, mm. I think, in one other topic at all. Interesting. So, Interesting. yeah. Interesting where people put their their hard lines on things. Uh, who's, I know Aporia magazine's a kind of a new outfit. Who's running things over there? Who's kind of the, uh, there's a guy owner. called uh, Matt, who's my boss, the editor, mm -hmm. uh, Noah Carl and Bo mm -hmm. Weingard, two exiled mm -hmm. academics are, mm -hmm. uh, now, um, editing over there. Mm -hmm. There, there was a bit of a, a leftist conspiracy that I am the editor. I do not have time <laughs> to edit that magazine. Uh, although I might, I might work for them in a more serious capacity at some point. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, I mean. To, you know, I just thought I could help out because people like to see women do interviews. <laughs> that's, that's basically it. <laughs> I did see the one you did with Paul Bloom not not too long ago, which was, which yeah. was nice. Paul's a great guy; he's really, really nice. Okay, that was yeah, fun. I'm a hard time. That yeah, was that was a, that was a fun. He he likes the kind of thought experiments. He's he's a he's a thinker like that. So it's it was, great. Yeah, that was, that was a cool that was a cool conversation. I I wonder um, what is uh what is it? Uh, so you you have the evolutionary psychology background um and so i guess the, the first question i have is we don't have to do too too deep a dive of that but i guess just generally how does that still kind of give you a kind of a framework or a kind of a kind of lens in which you see things or 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 does it not do you do you not uh, kind of use that framework anymore how, i guess how much does that still animate yeah. how you think about things so when you think about things from an evolutionary perspective it it's there's a variety of things that go into it. Number one is a, a cynical perspective about what certain behavior or attitudes or psychology buys you mm. in terms of the relevant adaptive goals. So like, for example, with how to train your boyfriend, the basic thesis is that all of us have the capacity to use behaviorism that is rewards and punishments to alter the behavior of others. You know, if, if there's a very strong framework and way to alter behavior of other organisms, which rewards and punishments are those, then we would imagine that those things would be instantiated into the the, the mind mm -hmm. such that we can change the behavior of others towards our own adaptive goals. And when you look at things in that kind of cynical way, um, it doesn't make me feel cynically about human motivation necessarily. It just, I, I know that there's always a certain selfish gene cynicism underlying things. Which, you know, if you don't have that framework, then literally people's motivations could be anything. Mm. It just makes makes um, things much more complicated. And people call that reductionistic, but reductionism is absolutely necessary mm. in order to understand anything. Mm. Um, another thing that evolutionary psychology buys us is a comparison with non-human animals. Mm -hmm. So if you are offended by comparison with non-human animals, which I see all the time, then evolutionary psychology is is not for you. and if you see a behavior or cost benefit analysis instantiated in other species, like in, in parenting or mating in other species, it can help you understand human beings. Uh, we are just another animal. I think that's really useful. Do, do people get really upset about that? I mean, I don't think that they, there isn't necessarily like an overt upset, uh -huh. but certainly people will say, you know, uh, when I, when I first started talking about this stuff for my book, the, the the behaviorist stuff. Um, I talked about a few different species. Uh, like there's a very unfortunate. <laughs> there's there are these uh, zebra finches, and uh, they did this funny experiment where they you know the zebra finches are both taking care of the young, 
and they held the mail back such that he came back late. And there was a very different uh, call repertoire that the female used mm. that was more shrill. And, you know, you could have called it unpleasant, mm. but it seemed like the female was punishing the male for being gone for too long because they had a tacit agreement about how long they would forage before they came back to sit on the eggs. Mm -hmm. And when I, you know, when I, when I compared human couples to that, um, people had objections, you know, and people will just say, oh, we're not birds or we're not dogs or we're not uh, other mammal species or we have culture or whatever. I don't necessarily think people are offended, but oftentimes their objection is simply we're not animals or we're not animals in that way, or we have these other motivations. The last thing I'll say about evolutionary psychology that I think is good is that, um, is that it looks at, at cost benefit analysis, right? It looks at, you know, how much attention do you have? How much, resources you know do you have um and where are you going to put this this energy and if you don't think about the costs and benefits that's another thing that you know thinking about costs and benefits also narrows down how you could explain certain kinds of behavior hmm. it's interesting how I, I i don't understand the resistance people have to some of the things about evolutionary psychology i mean it's not a one-to-one -one comparison with you fill in the blank animal i mean i think that there's plenty of things you can learn from other multicellular organisms other animals non-human animals and we fit in the the whole tree of life thing as well i don't really understand i don't i never really understand people's like i get i get some of the reductionistic kinds of things um i think also what people get upset about some of the seemingly deterministic things it's like oh these are the things about my nature my biology that's not changeable and people get upset about that i, I could see that but everything else i don't i don't i, I find it connected with the rest of the planet and how <laughs> organisms live on the planet we're no different in that way um and so yeah i think it's more powerful in that way i just don't understand how people are so upset about it well you know one of the higher order values that many people hold is the idea that human beings are malleable such that we could engineer a society in which people are going to be gentler or less discriminatory or less biased or less cruel or less selfish. And the comparison with non-human animals undercuts that. And, mm -hmm. you know, Steven Pinker and other people have talked about this, but in the, in the blank slate, mm -hmm. that's one of the, the things that he, he talks about a lot is that it's, it's very enticing to think about human behavior as more malleable because that's the means by which we would alter human behavior and you, you know, the idea that you can, you can engineer society in a variety of different ways. Um, I was listening to Angela Saini do an interview uh, recently about patriarchy. Uh, and although I, I, I think her other books are not great. Um, this is actually something I might be interested in checking out because she talks about all these different ways that you can engineer societies and, and different kinds of matriarchies. And I am interested in how well matriarchies could actually work in principle because it doesn't seem that we've converged on matriarchy as a way to organize society. And I wonder why that is, right? Yeah, but is it, isn't there, isn't there some, I, I don't know the work, but isn't there some kind of value we're, we're adding into the mix, right, that people do, right? So many people will talk negatively about patriarchy, which definitely has faults, but so would matriarchy too, right? I mean, I just think that yeah. there's not, there's 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 ways in which there's i think value to both now that there's going to be pitfalls to either way of doing things or or organizing a, a, a yeah. group of group of one species and there'll be positive things about it but i guess is your question not so much about the value of it of a matriarchal versus a patriarchal society but more of why does it more often happen that we have patriarchal as opposed to matriarchal yeah. societies i mean i think i have some idea about why we more often have patriarchies instead of matriarchies is because uh, matriarchies are more vulnerable to aggressive exploitation and aggressive incursions, right? Uh, because males are on average more aggressive. They think more defensively and they're more likely to think about, you know, defense. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think matriarchies might be more vulnerable uh, to, to all of the aggressive incursions that have happened throughout our evolutionary history that we see you know, in, in Y and X chromosomes, you know, you see this influx of, of, of Y chromosomes every few thousand years. And that, you know, that's, that's where the native populations were, um, 
enslaved or, or whatever happened, uh, all the males were killed. New males came in. That happened mm. over and over again. Mm. And I think a matriarchy would be uh, quite vulnerable to that. Mm. I, I mean, obviously there's, you know, obviously non-human uh, species that do have a more matriarchal. I think it's like a, maybe a dozen or so, right? You, you see about elephants and I think is it bees and what is what is the other Hyenas. bonobos and right? There's just certain animals, right, yeah. that have more matriarchal societies. What what do you what do we see that could that we could maybe learn about? You know, I think there's other other uh, groups or tribes maybe that have more matriarchal societies in different parts of the of, of the planet. Maybe less so now, but maybe in times past there was more of that. I mean, what do, what do we think is, I guess, different if there's a, a society led by uh, more of a matriarchal system? What what would be different than how it was in a patriarchal system? Do you think? I think with things like with like with with, with hyenas, I think it's like a a fluke of their development. With elephants, um, I think the males are are the the females have quite a a strong cooperative bond, and they chase the males out, mm -hmm. uh, so the males can't form a uh, like a reproductive monopoly. Mm -hmm. I think the idea with bonobos is that something similar: is that the this the sexual component of the females' relationships, the fact that they have sex all the time. And they're closely bonded in that way, enables them to cooperate um, to keep males out. And, you know, you could definitely see in terms of evolution, any species where there's not a huge amount of dimorphism. If females can cooperate enough, they can, um, they can prevent a patriarchy from, from happening. Uh, like, if if males have to compete for females, they'll they'll end up getting much bigger, and then they have the strength on their side, right? Mm -hmm. um, but uh, uh, I'm not I'm not an expert on this, and I'm I am curious about you know different human societies. It looks like if you have a matriarchy in, in a human society, that you have to have some other way of engineering uh, male paternal care mm -hmm. uh, or male care, and usually uh, what I've seen, I guess, is like brothers and uncles. Um, are the are the helpers at the nest because you do need some some extra help yeah interesting um so I, I guess one of the things is i guess in your research and things that you've looked at is you care you care a lot about relationships right studying human relationships how we have romantic relationships right or how we have relationships with with offspring so i i, I want to talk about something you've been writing about more recently in terms of eugenics the the, the wonderful word that everyone loves to talk about <laughs> Um, uh, I definitely want to talk about that. Uh, before that, I want to talk about something, you know, more popular, such as polyamory. Um, we don't have to spend as much time on it. I want to save most of the time for eugenics, but so, you know, I talked about this with Jeff when he was on there and he, he gave a really nice, um, overview of, of, of polyamorous relationships. And uh, he, he talked a lot about a, a kind of like a tier system of how it kind of works more practically. Um, I guess so. Uh, one question I have for you is, you know, I guess a kind of broad, broad lens here. Throughout time, I think it's important for people to know that we've had polygynous societies and then back to mon monogamous to polygynous to monogamous. We see this shift, uh, and there, I guess, polyamorous relationships are more um, in the minority now among humans. Um, and there could be reasons for that uh, that people have discussed. But what do you think in general, I guess, that kind of arc of how humans will have uh, romantic or sexual relationships with each other through time and why it's so taboo, I guess, in more modern societies now? So the modal most common form of organizing romantic relationships throughout evolutionary history has been polygyny. So um, men could have more than one mate if they could afford it in terms of resources and time and status. Um, but the majority of males had one or zero mates. Um, and that made a lot of sense, especially in times when, when men had higher mortality, there were often fewer men than women. Mm. Um, so it made sense to uh, give more than one woman to a, to a man who could afford it. Um, there were fewer like rogue single males around. There is a problem of, of men who don't have any partners, um, in terms of society, uh, and violence, because if you're an evolutionary dead end, you have very little to lose. And so the majority of the time that we see really 
terrible acts of violence or insurrections and things like that. They're led by um, mateless uh, males. Mm. So uh, there's this thing called the polygyny threshold model where women have to decide. The joke is you have to decide if you want to be the second wife of JFK or the only wife of Bozo the Clown. Right. That's the joke. But the idea is, you know, uh, yes, women would prefer to monopolize a good quality male all to themselves, but oftentimes you don't get that option, right? Mm. You get, you get to be somebody's only mate who nobody else wants, Mm. or you get to be somebody's extra mate who lots of people want. Mm. (laughs) So that, uh, there's a, there seems to be some degree of human psychology that's, you know, adapted for this. And I actually listened to a really good uh, ethnography called Guests of the Sheik, which was a lot about um, polygyny, you know, harems, mm-hmm. how co-wives get along with each other or not in uh, in 1950s Iraq, um, and about how women, you know, often didn't want to have a co-wife, but sometimes co-wives got along very well. Mm-hmm. Co-wives typically don't don't get along great. So there's a lot of different ways to like organize uh, organize relationships. Um, it's very interesting. Uh, blocked and reported Katie Herzog and Jesse single mm-hmm. uh, were wondering if, uh, you know, polygynous or what not polyamorous people will be welcome at pride. And they asked a mm-hmm. listserv that I'm on, which is called SexNet, If polyamory is a sexual orientation. And the consensus was it's not really a sexual orientation because everybody given their druthers would have more than one partner if they could. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it's actually not an unusual thing to, mm-hmm. to want to have more than one partner. And there's this, uh, researcher out of the UK. Um, I wasn't at HBEST this year, but he, I think his name is Andrew Thompson, uh, who said something like 30 to 50% of men say that they would have more than one partner. I think it's fewer women who say they would have more than one partner. So uh, sexual orientation sort of implies a rarity. It seems like the, like a large minority or even a majority of people, if they could, um, would have more than one partner. Now, polyamory is, there's like a variety of different ways to do it. Uh, Jeffrey and I are quite skeptical of the culture of polyamory or even, you know, books about how to do it because, uh, because it's quite a leftist philosophy. They seem pretty averse to an idea, any, any kind of evolutionary psych ideas about how to best do it. Um, and what you see in sort of lefty progressive spaces is this idea that humans are just so diverse Mm. that, there's no way to organize your life that works better on average for everybody, mm-hmm. uh, that it's, it's going to be extremely different for, for each person. So the way that we organize our relationships is one that's informed by jealousy and by evolutionary psychology. The way that um, we see many polyamorous people organize their relationships um, has mostly to do with like feelings from moment to moment and also just a complete uh, rejection of sex differences. So for example, um, I know a polyamorous couple, they're not polyamorous. They're actually just in an open relationship. And she set the rules and her rule was, and they ended up breaking up over this, um, that he could sleep with somebody, but only once never again. (laughs) And that's, if you look at, you know, the the evolution of jealousy, that's makes sense as a female rule about Mm -hmm how to organize an open relationship because um, women are more emotionally jealous than men Mm -hmm. and women are more emotionally jealous because emotional jealousy is a guide to whether a man is giving his resources away to some other woman. And the adaptive problem that women had to solve with so-called mate poachers, that is people who are trying to take away your mate Mm -hmm. is that uh, a man would divest his resources to somebody else. A woman doesn't have to worry about taking care of another woman's kids because all the kids that come out of her are hers. And she knows that, Mm -hmm. but she does have to worry about her, the attend, time, attention, and provisioning that is her mates uh, being allocated to somebody else. Whereas men are more concerned about, are they taking care? Are they going to be cucked, right? Are they taking <laughs> care of somebody else's kids? <laughs> Cuck has become an incredibly popular word in the discourse in all kinds of ways. There's the, the like politics and race mm-hmm. and all kinds of stuff, but mm-hmm. it's extremely evocative. Uh, you know, some people have gotten in trouble for this, but uh, you know, f- women, women uh, imagine have nightmares about uh, a man jumping out of the bushes and a strange about stranger rape, basically. Mm-hmm. 
because for a woman, that's like the worst possible thing that could happen in terms of her, you know, other than being murdered, um, is, uh, for a strange man that she's had no opportunity to vet at all, um, to rape her and get her pregnant. Um, for men, the worst adaptive outcome is to be cucked is to, to, is to, to be with a woman, to provision her, to forsake all others, and then be taking care of some other man's kids. And so it makes sense that to be called a cuck or to the discussions of cuckoldry would have the same emotional valence and power mm -hmm. as stranger jumping out of the bushes and, and raping you mm -hmm. for, for a woman. Mm -hmm. And I don't think that's really um, appreciated enough. Mm -hmm. In well, any what? case, uh, sorry, go ahead. Is that why I'm still trying to understand why do people, I, I think, I think, I think from my understanding is most people resist this. And again, I'm not making a personal claim towards one or the other. I'm just interested in the idea, especially if in times past, this is how humans have done things. Granted, there are many reasons for doing that, but why it's like people can't get over the like jealousy piece of it. Right. How, how do you usually explain that to people when they're like, so if you're in a polyamorous relationship and both people have, you know, multiple you know, partners of different degrees, you know, people say, well, you know, the, what is, you know, I don't want the people don't usually want this person with someone else or for whatever reason, or it will be, you know, what if there's something that's better or worse, or what if the person isn't with me anymore? I guess, how do you, how do you, how does the jealousy component fit into um, again, everyone's different, every relationship different, but how does that fit into polyamorous relationships of how, how it's handled, I guess, or how it's dealt with? Yes. People, people differ a lot on jealousy. I know some people who are practically immune to jealousy that almost never feel jealous. Um, I have a friend who was polyamorous for many years and she was deeply jealous. She had two male partners, but mm -hmm. they couldn't see anyone else really in practice because she was so jealous. So Unfortunately, our desire for other people and our degree of jealousy is not always aligned, mm. right? For the most part, um, people who are more relaxed uh, in terms of jealousy, um, you know, they don't mind their partners having other partners. So that's one piece of the puzzle that can be uh, quite difficult to navigate is uh, is jealousy. What some people don't understand, I, I made a joke about this on, on Twitter, um, I made a joke that said, imagine a Joe Rogan kind of interview where a guy says, I dive 50 meters down into icy cold water with sharks and I've conquered fear of death. I've conquered fear of cold. I've conquered uh, my desire to breathe oxygen. And you say, well, what, what do you do if your wife dances with other man? I'll kill him. Right. <laughs> like, <laughs> so like because of this cuckoldry thing, because of this, that's the masculinity portion of it. Um, the idea of desensitizing yourself to jealousy seems seems bad uh, to many people because they think of jealousy as being profoundly, profoundly useful. So people want to desensitize themselves to other emotions, bad emotions, anger, hunger, even people want to like be able to get less sleep, but desensitizing yourself to jealousy is more threatening because it could make you a cuck. And we've talked about cucking <laughs> more than, more than I imagined that we would um, uh, in this interview. Um, so that's one piece of it. Um, in terms of like, you know, you kind of just have to, you know, to, you know, to think about the costs and the benefits and um, Dan Savage, who has been advocating monogamish relationships, which is actually what, you know, what I think is actually the most sustainable way to do anything like this is to have, you know, he said, just because you're in an open relationship doesn't mean the door has to be like blown off the hinges. You could have some small allowances for outside contact. And in some ways, um, a relationship where you're allowed to sleep with other people on occasion, like once or twice a year or whatever, is less fragile than a relationship where there's an expectation of complete 100% monogamy. Yeah, how, because, how, how, how so? Yeah, how so? Well, because, you know, whatever, I can't remember what the percentage is, like, it depends on what survey you look at. If 30 to 70% of people will cheat at some point, mm -hmm. right? And your criteria for maintaining a relationship is that you have to be 100% monogamous, then that's it. You cheat, that's it, right? Whereas if you have some allowance for that, or you're like, okay, you know. I can tell you everybody's fallible when it comes to 
um, wanting to have sex with other people, the majority of, of maybe the majority of men and women, uh, <laughs> there's, there's like this, I, I didn't have this, but my friend had it at her bachelorette party, um, decor that you can put around that says one penis forever. <laughs> um, and it's very much, yeah, it's very much like that. But in any case, you know, you look at that, um, that desire. And so, you know, it's, it's similar to like, a, I don't know, a diet, right. Mm-hmm. Or, uh, I, I think people think about, think about having sex with other people more like, like a heroin habit. Like you'll have, you know, you do heroin once and then you'll do it all the time mm-hmm. as opposed to like, I don't know, eating a donut, which is more of what it's like, I think, Mm -hmm. uh, when you're, when you're supposed to be eating salad. But another thing that I think is threatening to people is the following. Most people who end up in relationships together get in relationships for, uh, not extremely deep reasons. They get together because they are attracted to each other because they live in the same place. And because they're relatively nice to each other, they're like somewhat compatible. Right. Mm -hmm. And that is extremely sensitive to somebody else coming in because there's, there's a lot of other people around who could be as good as, as compatible with you as th- this other person is. Right. Mm-hmm. So like, let's say I meet somebody on Tinder mm-hmm. and all we have in common is that we're attracted to each other and we like each other and we're nice to each other. Mm-hmm. Yeah, anybody else could come along and be more compatible with my partner. Mm-hmm. So in general, what I say is that um, if you're going to have any kind of um, relationship that's uh, that's open, you have to figure out how you are not substitutable, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so that's so that's my so that's my my point. My question here is: I think most people, aside from the jealousy thing, which you know, again, there's a variance there among people. But one thing is, I think some people subscribe some type of uh, if you're with another person. It's always the commitment factor, which I think is kind of what you're getting at, right? Which is, well, you're not committed to me, right? Mm-hmm. And and it sounds like what you're saying is, no, no, no. You can be committed to somebody um, in one way. And you can be committed, if you want to use that term, to other people in very nominal, superficial ways. Like, it doesn't have to be this ongoing kind of thing. There doesn't need to be this whole kind of, like, relationship where it's, like, emotionally invested and all these things. The person that you are with that's a type of commitment, but it's not a locked, sealed, you know, door where no other things can can happen. Is is that somewhere what you're saying? Like, what's this kind of role of commitment here? I guess that most people think. Oh, okay, about. yeah. I mean, I I think commitment is is a um, there's traditionalist commitment, like there's commitment ceremonies, there's marriages, there's vows. There's yeah. it's talking yeah. about how committed you are in front of other people, such that they enforce your commitment to each other. And mm-hmm. usually there's not really much reason to do that. If you're not going to have kids, if you're going to have kids, there's a reason to do that. If you're going to have a house or something like that, that's fine too. Um, but there's also commitment. That's just an outgrowth of irreplaceability, mm-hmm. right? Is that, um, and that's just economics, right? I, mm-hmm. I can't get anybody else who's going to be as, um, as compatible with me as you are, you are irreplaceable to me because I'm weird in X, Y, Z reasons, and you're compatibly weird with me in X, Y, X, Y, Z reasons. Um, you can also see irreplaceability as an outgrowth of just being together a really long time, mm-hmm. um, where you just have a lot of a lot of history together. Uh, but one thing that people I think don't get is like somebody being willing to um, have a somewhat open relationship or to have a relaxed uh, attitude towards jealousy or be willing to desensitize their jealousy itself makes you more irreplaceable. And there's a whole irreplaceability literature in like evolutionary psychology, which is if you're in a group of people, you try and figure out what's lacking in this group of people. Is there somebody who's like, can you be more entertaining? Can you be stronger? Can you be more strategizing? Can you be smarter? Can you uh, be nicer than everybody else in such a way that you are irreplaceable to the group? But there's also ways to be irreplaceable in a relationship. And one way to be irreplaceable in a relationship is to allow somebody to um, have romantic or sexual encounters with other people because oftentimes other people won't allow that. So open relationships or polyamory itself is a, is a means to irreplaceability. Hmm. It's interesting. So it de- And that depends on each each person, right? That depends on each kind of relationship, what what the uh, components or the variables of 
irreplaceability are are going to be different for each person, obviously, and for each relationship. So, for example, if you know uh, there's a guy and he likes this girl, and and the girl likes him back, and it's mutual, and they get together and they find that there could be other people that could come in their lives at different points, but these four things are just like irreplaceable. Like this is like you're number one. You're like like there's just not the uniqueness of that person in the relationship is not replaceable. It doesn't matter if you find someone else that could just like blow your mind sexually and like, it's a great time. Well, they don't, that's great, but they don't have all these other irreplaceable things that you have with your first partner or something like that. And that's also why people, you know, people develop unusual hobbies or they, you know, they, they want to meet in these various different ways. Um, Like, I don't know. I, I know somebody. Somebody likes to play Dungeons and Dragons. There's a very few other women who would like to also play Dungeons and Dragons, right? That's kind of an irreplaceable uh, characteristic. And I, you know, there's a, a concept that I talk about in my book, which I talk about something called weirding, where you try and get somebody to enjoy the same things that you do. You try and get them to like the same hobbies as you or have the same attitudes that you do, especially if they're rare or unusual, because you make them more compatible with you and less compatible with everyone else. Mm. And I think that that's a, a motivation that people have is to weird their partners. Mm. Interesting. That's really interesting. I guess the last thing I'll ask about this is, so, I mean, I guess what is this, I mean, your mind or your opinion, I mean, are, are there different ways of doing this? I'm sure there are. I mean, how do you see this? Practically, like how do people practically not do this? I mean, I, I've become a little bit cynical or sort of skeptical about this because I've I've met people who, you know, run businesses and run their lives and are incredibly successful in domains of life, have successful families, and they just b- crash and burn mm-hmm. when it comes to like opening up their um, their relationships and there's a variety of reasons why I think it's partly because it's very difficult to predict how you'll react in situations where you're very emotionally aroused, like when you're very jealous. Mm. Um, And it's also because I think, you know, typical polyamory advice is, is often really bad. It just says, you know, try out all these different permutations of things until you get to something you're comfortable with, with Mm. without predictions about what you're going to be comfortable with and without really understanding what the differences are between, uh, between men and women. Um, In my view, most people would like a stable, consistent relationship over time. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes young people like to have multiple, you know, juggling multiple relationships. Most people, of course, there's a, a minority of people who love drama, but most people don't want to have dramatic, tumultuous relationships with other people. Um, the people who do like dramatic, tumultuous relationships are like people with borderline personality disorder. Um they might make up, I don't know, five or 10% of the population, but I like to say that they're in heavy circulation. They're like mm. dimes, <laughs> right? They, <laughs> they get cycled through a lot because, uh, so I think women with borderline personality disorder, um, even if a man doesn't date very much, he often dates one or three or five of women with borderline personality disorder because they have short relationships because mm. they get romantically involved very quickly. Um, mm. and because they're in heavy circulation. Mm. Um, you know, even I myself have been in, in like, I don't know, two or three relationships with borderline personality disorder women. It's very easy to to come across them and they're very alluring. Mm -hmm. So my view is that hierarchical polyamory, find somebody that you're very compatible with somebody that you're somewhat irreplaceable with, uh, wait in slowly, see where your jealousy is at. Um, also this is all going to sound eminently reasonable. I think to most people, um, and also trade off your desire for outside romantic or sexual contact with uh, your capacity for jealousy or your jealousy um, threshold. And there's tons of people out there who are happy to be monogamous forever. Mm-hmm. But you also see people, you know, I, I, I watch some reality television shows where like somebody's not even allowed to have lunch with their ex-girlfriend or ex-boyfriend or text them or whatever, right? Mm-hmm. And so when people, people make fun of polyamory all the time, that's fine. I don't care. But there are tons of monogamous people where you break up with your ex-boyfriend or ex-girlfriend and you have to pretend that you never knew them. I've, I've had these conversations and it is very interesting to see the different answers I get from people. Um, 
there's people that be like, yeah, sure. I mean, if they're in town and, you know, whatever, that was, you know, 10 years ago, who cares? Like, whatever, we all moved on. Other people would be like, you know, absolutely not. You can't have, like, they never existed. Like, you never had the relationship. Maybe other people are in, in somewhere between. And it's, it's, I think it really just depends on each person's kind of, I don't know, personal ethos or something like that. Um, everyone has just a bit different answer, but it's fascinating to me to see all the different answers that people will get. If you go to a party and you ask people this question, you ask 10 different people at the party this question, you yep. get 10 different answers. Even people who are like really sophisticated and reasonable. I'll uh-huh. just say there's some aspects of monogamous culture that I think are toxic or even, you know, abusive gets thrown around a lot. You know, the idea that like, oh, you're cutting off somebody from your family, you're cutting off somebody from their friends. You know, what you see it a lot, a lot in, in, Western society with nuclear families and stuff like that is that um, families get very atomized and people get very atomized Mm -hmm. in part because of the blank acceptance of these rules that you can't talk to anybody that you dated. Mm -hmm. Um, And that creeps into not having a friend group, not having any opposite sex friends, not being in context where you might interact with opposite sex people. Mm -hmm. And opposite sex people, the opposite. Yeah. So I think that, uh, you know, that, um, sure. You know, you, you can sh- show me pictures of whatever there is that there's that, um, horrible polyamorous family, quote unquote, where there's a woman who had a kid with who knows who, and there were like four incels or previous incels, you know, living with her. And that's super cringe, mm-hmm. but it's also super cringe when you know, thousands of people, uh, across this country, who you can't even have lunch with a coworker Mm -hmm. because they have the wrong set of genitals, you know, Mm -hmm. that's also Mm -hmm. screwed up and cringe. Yeah. 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 There's, there's definitely people that are out there like that. And it's, I guess my question is always the why kind of thing. And I find that a lot of people, you just can't, the convert, we haven't talked about it here, but people just cannot get past the moral moralization of this. They just can't get, it's wrong and it's just wrong and you don't do it. Or, you know, fill in the blank religion says you're not supposed to do that. Or, you know, that's just not how you do it. My family didn't raise me that way. Like, it, there's just the morals always get in the way of it. And that's fine. People, I mean, again, I'm in, in a monogamous relationship. Like, I think there's there's all, you know, there's pros and cons to a lot of different things. It doesn't have to be for somebody. But it's just interesting to me how people, if you even have a conversation about it, they get very, uh, I don't know, almost sanctimonious in some ways of like, well, you know, you can't do, you can't do it that way. That's not right. That's not the moral. And it's like, well, that's fine for you if you, if you honestly believe that, but it is one of those things where it's like, but if somebody else does it, why the, why the condemnation? And, and then also this kind of going back to the thing that you said earlier is if you ask people in an anonymous survey, would they want to be with somebody else? You know, it's 30 to 70% of people would love to have sex with someone else, regardless of the status of their relationship. So it's like, okay, so what's, what's the kind of like projection here that people are doing? I mean, that's what I find is really frustrating about having the conversation. Open relationships, polyamory. And this is something that I've come to fairly recently. These are, you could call them luxury beliefs, right? If I was like, everybody could do polyamory, everybody could make it work. It's not true, right? Yeah. But if I say you need X, Y, Z characteristics to make it work, and those characteristics are rare, then people are going to you know, think that I'm I'm really like elitist, <laughs> um, that I'm saying that people should do something like, I don't know, um, sleep four hours a day or or um, fast for 10 days at a time or any of the other very difficult things to do. So I have come to the this idea that like, people are going to be very um, averse to things that are, that they feel could be bad for the average person. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, talking to Louise Perry, who wrote the case against the sexual revolution. Mm -hmm. um, Yeah. There are some women who could do an OnlyFans and make a million dollars a year. Mm -hmm. Right. But if I told all women you could be empowered by having an OnlyFans and you can make money by having an OnlyFans. A lot of women are going to crash and burn. They're not going to be able to uh, fight a partner or find um, or, or even keep a job because they had a, a previous OnlyFans or to say women, you know, be sexually liberated, have sex with as many people as you want. There are many women who are going to be full of sexual regret. And so there's always this, this tension 
between paternalism, mm-hmm. which is saying, actually, everybody should do the X thing that's going to work for the average person and promulgating, propagating uh, behaviors and uh, life choices that are going to screw up some people's lives. Mm. And there, there's always a tension between those two things. And people don't like being told, no, you actually couldn't do that because you are a typical woman. And uh, typically women experience sexual regret and they don't want to um, have sex with tons of people. You know, sexual liberation is not for you. It's for this 10% of women with high sexuality, low regret, low disgust sensitivity. It's it's difficult. So when you want to make advice for lots of people. Yeah. If I want to give advice to everybody, I would say be monogamous because that's going to work for the average person mm-hmm. uh, better. Or you could do the French method, which is actually what people do in practice in the United States to, you know, although the United States is way more puritanical than France, mm-hmm. which is um, be in monogamous relationships, occasionally have sex with other people, feel terrible about it and never talk about it. Mm-hmm. And that also works actually pretty well for the average person. It rubs people the wrong way because it's dishonest, Mm -hmm. but it works fine. Mm -hmm. And I've become much less like strident about, about advocating anything Mm -hmm. Um, because the solutions that people come up with on their own, even if they make them feel, I don't know if you can curse on your podcast, if they make them feel shitty sometimes, that's, that's fine. Um, The last thing that I was going to say is, yeah, uh, you know, people are also always going on about monogamy being better for uh, for children or being better for like a stable home life. And there's this, I think it's partly because of the disparity in um, achievement between white, blacks, Asians, and Hispanics that people say uh, a nuclear family with a present father is really the best thing because there's this correlation with father absence and all these bad outcomes. And one hilarious thing that people accuse, you know, Polly or Emery or people who advocate open relationships of is like being responsible for the dissolution and therefore the problems in uh, Black America. Um, very briefly, because I actually, I really, really need to write something about this. Uh, you know how people are always going on about how in China, uh, there's more men than women. It's going to cause all these problems. If you mm-hmm. look at the black community in this country, there's way more women than men. And that's partly why. In, ter- in terms of black women than, than men? Yeah, there's way uh-huh. more black yeah. women than men because whatever. I don't know what percentage of black men are in prison. Six percent, I think. Or excuse me, is it six million? It's something like that. I forget what it is. I looked it up. Yeah, there's, there's, there's not enough black men to go around, yeah. really. Yeah. And so um, when you see... In, like, if you look at a, a college campus where women outnumber men, mm-hmm. women tend to be competing for the few men that are available, and they compete by using sex. And men get what they want, which is they generally don't have to commit as much in order to get sexual access, and they can generally have more than one partner if they want to. And so, um, advocating polyamory or open relationships has nothing to do with black men not sticking around and being fathers. It's because they have lots of other opportunities. Mm. Uh, because mm. there's not enough black men to go around mm-hmm. because so many black men um, are in prison. Mm. Um, and you could say that, you know, father absence causes these problems. I've, I've advocated many times that I don't think it does, but this is one rationalization for being against polyamory and open relationships is that it's going to, um, it's going to corrupt the nuclear family. Mm-hmm. So yeah, there's almost a like a, there's like a weird racial element to this, right. Mm-hmm. Which mm-hmm. is like, I'm Fleischman. I'm a Jewess. I'm trying to get the Gentiles to 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 fuck around so that they so that the, there's this breakdown of the white nuclear family. That's my that's my end goal. Yep. That's the so just so you you guys you've listened this far, forty five minutes in, you guys now know my my objective. That's your scheme. That's right. <laughs> Yeah, then I'm I mean, going to drink your children's blood on a high holidays. <laughs> <laughs> I do think it is. I, I, I do wonder. I, I think there's one thing I did talk about this before, which was, you know, sometimes, again, I think there's difficulty with this, but sometimes people will be in polyamorous or open relationships or, or, or uh, of whatever sort. Um, not forever. It might be for a time. 
And then they might want to later in life not do that anymore, or they might yeah. start one way and then do it later in life or whatever. And I think sometimes people feel so. I think like I do. I do think that it would be pretty challenging to do that with with children. Um, not to say that it's not done, but I would I, I would imagine there's just <laughs> if you're trying to be a really good parent, they just take so much of your time and your energy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> and your you know, money. People, people, people are, I think, have really, really high opinions of my energy level. Like, I'm like eight months pregnant. They're like, are you guys still polyamorous? I'm like, oh, yeah. I'm going on tons of dates right now. <laughs> tons of them. Done. But um, Ayla has got some interesting stuff about polyamory, like it's some data and, you mm-hmm. know, showing people in their 50s and 60s. And um, mm-hmm. certainly you also see like older people who become companionate over time. And there's, you know, as I said, I think monogamy works better for most people. But if you, if the choice is between, let's say a man in his fifties and his wife is in her fifties. She's gone through menopause and she's like not interested in having sex at all anymore. Uh, and they could stay together. He could take care of her and she could take care of him in their old age. If only they make allowances for sex outside of their relationship. I think that's actually uh, the the most workable solution, but people are going to do what they're going to do. And, and I, I don't, I don't, as much as I love to ruffle feathers, I just, I've gotten tired of bending people out of shape on this particular topic. No, no, I, I can imagine it must, it must feel like a broken record at a certain point. I will say, I think your point, the, the takeaway for me on that is yes, you're going to have be with other people sexually and be with maybe let's say a, a kind of steady, you know, kind of committed partner as well. in in this kind of dynamic, you're just honest about it where people are in monogamous relationships and they do that anyways, and they're just lying or withholding or they're riding around with guilt and shame because they, you know, did whatever. And they don't, it's like, well, hmm. And if, if there's a lot, what is it? You know, divorce rate is still like, you know, 50%. A large part of that is uh, because of um, infidelity. It's like, well, again, it's not for everybody, but I think that's something to definitely consider. I think for people to say, hmm, what's going on here? And there's pros and cons to all different types of relationships. Um, but I think it's, it's interesting. I think it's, I think it's good food for thought for people to kind of say, hmm, especially for if you're not with anybody and you want to be in a relationship, what, what, what that might look like and challenging or questioning your own beliefs of like, well, these are my, my values or my morals, but why are they that way? Is it because that's what my parents mm-hmm. taught me or that's what I learned in church or is that what I really believe? Or and I think it's good for people to, um, to think about that. And again, I'm not promoting one way or the other, but I do think it's good for people to, 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 to think about how they want to have relationships. Okay. So, uh, let's move on to an easier topic. So eugenics, uh, <laughs> uh, this is another one that, that people like to, uh, to get animated about. Um, okay. So I guess the first question is, uh, I know you've written about it recently and you're interested in it. So I, I want to, you know, get the full download on why, but that, that's my first question is, why are you interested in this? Do you just want to piss people off? Is that what it is? You just want to piss people off? I do off? enjoy pissing people off. Absolutely. Yeah, but yeah. <laughs> um, in this particular case, I feel I feel like I have a unique position, which is mm-hmm. I'm not an active academic. Mm-hmm. I know, you know, off the record, a lot of people agree with me. In fact, sure. um, you know, there's, 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 uh, there's, there's a few lefty academics on, on Twitter and other places who have been like, you know, why do people talk to Diana? Um, it's because they agree with me or <laughs> sometimes it's because they agree with me and sometimes it's they don't agree with me, but they just don't think I've said anything terrible. Mm-hmm. Um, so now we are decades into this genetics revolution. We yeah. understand behavioral genetics better than we used to. Mm-hmm. There are now ways of improving upon uh, what you could call the random roll of the dice that we engage in when we have children naturally. And, I've had my children without IVF thus far. Mm-hmm. Um, so I have also engaged in this random roll of the dice, although I have carefully selected my my husband um, for his <laughs> for his genetics. In any case, it's uh, a good hair, isn't it? It's a good hair. That's I what think it is. It's partly the good hair, yeah. <laughs> um, genetics is super important. We now know that. Uh, mm-hmm. there's been a lot of efforts to try and improve, I don't know, the the, the social environment to improve schools, to improve nutrition, to reduce lead exposure. Some of these things have been very helpful and some of them have not. And so it seems like the final frontier is to look at how we can improve uh, genetics to, you know, and 
to help make people um, smarter, more conscientious, uh, healthier, longer lived, happier, more mentally well. These are all things that we know have a, a genetic component. So it really runs me the wrong way. Go ahead. I wanted, I wanted to cut in there. Sorry, because I think you said most people agree with you, whether they do, you know, in private emails or maybe they don't publicly, but that's like, yeah, yeah, I get you. Do you think all of this resistance, I don't want to say all, but a majority of this resistance is just because or predominantly because of the really dark history of eugenics between 1870s to 1940 or whatever it was that that period where that was very prevalent where people were literally trying to say that you know people of different races were legitimately genetically dumber than others or that they you know we try to make sure that we you know want to you know try and dispose of these things like is it is it that whole dark history that people are just like yes eugenics equals bad the end is that a huge part of it in the background i'll go into Nazi eugenics for a minute. So if you look at a few, a few, a couple months ago, one thing that people were getting bent out of shape of about on Twitter was um, this calculator that was available, I think, through the telegraph, which would help you calculate in terms of your disability, your health problems, et cetera, if you were giving more money to the government or if you were taking more money from the government. Mm -hmm. So it was like a cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. Now, the Nazis, it was a socialist regime, right? right? And so part of the accounting of a socialist regime is to consider whether or not somebody is putting more resources into the system or taking more resources out of the system. And I think that's part of why eugenics is, is uniquely um, is is uniquely threatening to people who are on the left or people who are in favor of redistribution, is because it makes sense to think about who is going to be born and whether they're going to be a, a net benefit or a net cost on the system. If you have a centralized welfare state, if you're more libertarian or more capitalistic like I am, then these are going to be decisions left up to individuals and everybody's not going to be paying in necessarily if somebody is uh, is disabled or has a long-term health problems, their families are going to be taking care of that more so than than the government. So I think that's partly why uh, these things are uniquely threatening. Yeah, I mean, there's been a lot written about, obviously, Nazi eugenics and um, social Darwinism, mm -hmm. uh, Galton, things like mm -hmm. that. Right. One thing to kind of point out, which I didn't know, actually, until I started following some historians of eugenics uh, talking about this online, is that Galton was also not in favor of anything like uh, the government saying okay, now you, you, and you, you guys get sterilized. No, you get murdered. Mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, any kind of centralized government authority. What Galton wanted was for society to have this consideration of hereditary genius, right? Was for society to think about, okay, should we encourage um, some people to have children because they have special skills, they have special qualities that are rare and, and valuable. And so, uh, there's a very interesting Slate Star Codex blog where he, I think, it's kind of like a script between four different people. And he mm -hmm. talks about Paul Ehrlich and the, and the population bomb, where Paul Ehrlich was saying, actually, there's a, going to be a Malthusian collapse and uh, our world cannot support this population. And uh, Ehrlich's philosophy was used as a pretense to sterilize literally millions of Indians. And yet the idea, if somebody goes out into the public square and says, look, there's too many people, there's overpopulation, mm -hmm. nobody immediately says, no, mm -hmm. that's going to be a slippery slope to sterilizing people against their will. Mm -hmm. So for me, when I talk about eugenics, what I really want to do is say there is a way of considering the genetic component to so-called desirable and so-called undesirable characteristics. People say this is culturally uh, conditioned, but everybody says being smart, um, strong, healthy, long lived and happy are, are good things. And any environmental in intervention towards these goals is on the table. So it's, I think, totally disingenuous to say that these things are like not universally valued. They are universally valued. Mm -hmm. It's just that we have different ideas about how to get to those things. Um, to say that that's a slippery slope to genocide, but to not say 
that save the whales or the world is overpopulated is, is a slippery slope to sterile, like sterilization or even murder um, because the one child policy did involve uh, a lot of unwanted uh, abortions, w- women who were forced, forced to have uh, abort children that they wanted. So I think that we should be able to say, these are the good parts of the ideas. These are the bad parts of this idea and to, to decouple them. And I'll talk a little bit about decoupling because mm-hmm. I, I think it's an important cognitive it's it's an important concept which is that we should be able to consider ideas in the abstract consider ideas their their merits and uh what's good and bad about them their pros and cons without necessarily always leaping to okay because this idea is associated with this other idea it's intrinsically uh, bad mm-hmm. just because the idea that the world is overpopulated is associated with sterilizing millions of Indians in the seventies doesn't necessarily mean that the idea that the world is overpopulated is inherently bad. Mm-hmm. And just because the idea that um, some people have genetics that predispose them to be um, healthier, happier, and more productive is associated with some historical atrocities. Does not mean that behavioral genetics itself is also bad? Mm-hmm. I guess that yeah, because the the question is uh, the piece that you wrote. I mean, made, made a lot of sense. Is look, I mean, when 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 women are pregnant, they go and they get genetic testing to see what are the things that they're predisposed, and we can make certain guesses or certain uh, um, you know what's the percentile of this might be an occurrence. So if somebody has you know Huntington's disease, right, is a common one, or they have uh, other types of genetic you know uh, diseases. You're going to say, okay, here's the likelihood, and we can preventively like people do this with um, what is it the 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 BRCA gene, right, for women that breast cancer or whatever it is, right? And you can say, listen, mm-hmm. you say eighty percent chance you're going to get breast cancer. Your mother, your grandmother, your great grandmother all had it, so we're going to, you know, this is a preventative measure to do a you know mastectomy or double mastectomy, and you know, and you can obviously do corrective surgery afterwards, and you won't have cancer, and we like that. That's great because you know we're saving. Uh, people from cancer, which is terrible, and they die from it. But we don't see that as a type of mm, genetic kind of intervention or genetic kind of sifting through. Why do you think, is this just like good PR on people? (laughs) It's like, this is proactive medicine, so it's great. But if it's other things like, um, you know, when we talk about eugenics in general, we don't, we don't, Put it in that bucket. Is that is is that just kind of like a you know if you call it something different from you know, that kind of decoupling of like the eugenics bad word because there's a bad history there? Is it is it just that, or is there something more pernicious there, or something more under the surface of why people resist this? There's a lot of people who agree with me in principle. Like for example, Richard Hanania wrote a piece saying why I disagree with eugenics. He disagrees with using the term eugenics, which is the the piece that I wrote was basically saying we should reclaim this word because it's being applied to various different things. But a lot of people in back channel or even overtly in the, in the, you know, Twitter or whatever have said, a lot of this stuff is going to get accepted eventually. Right. So in the piece that I wrote uh, for Aporia, which is um, healthy babies versus bad arguments, I talk about a lot of things that were originally controversial, but are now accepted and nobody would call eugenics. So Mm -hmm. like you're talking about, right. Um, I do IVF. Let's say there's a, I have a history of breast cancer in my family Mm -hmm. and I decide to select against a child that is going to have a BRCA gene so that my daughter, if I choose to have a daughter, obviously the best way to to not have a child with breast cancer would be to have a son rather than a daughter, Mm -hmm. um, would be to, to do a monogenic screening against this, this BRCA gene. Now, back in 2006, when this was rolled out, it was said, this is like designer babies. This is bad, right? Mm-hmm. Whereas now, I don't think anybody would would have a problem with that. Uh, and the piece that I wrote was about polygenic screening, which is can be used for things like health characteristics. Um, genomic prediction has a health index, uh, an index of, of thousands of genes that they use. And uh, in a white population, because the sample population is white, uh, you can choose an embryo that on average will live four years longer than another embryo using this um, health index, uh, mm-hmm. genetic health index. Um, and that's what Simone and Malcolm Collins used to pick one of their 
uh, children was this uh, this health index. Now, this is also considered controversial, but people like Razib Khan have said, you know, just don't stir the pot, right? In a few years, nobody's going to think anything of this anymore. And to me, uh, I guess I, I just, I'm very interested in um, how people divide up what's acceptable, and what's unacceptable. And mm -hmm. for the most part, we are governed by our emotions. We're governed by disgust and unfamiliarity. And it's because using polygenic screening is unfamiliar that people are calling eugenics and that they're saying that it's wrong when in 10 years they might not. And I guess this kind of gets down to one of my more core passions, which is disgust sensitivity and aversion mm -hmm. to novel technologies, right? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, talk, 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 talk. I guess talk about some of that because I think there's. Um, I know you've you've done research on on disgust and everything, and I think that there's obviously you know there's like the three major types of disgust, right? You have the the primary and the sexual and the moral disgust, and maybe there's other ones as well. But to me, that there seems to be this kind of maybe this fits in the moral category if you if you want to place yeah. it there, uh, or maybe it's cross lateral. But this idea of I, I always think about these things like. <clears throat> Um, when, when people do different types of screenings and it's early on and they say, okay, you know, because of these things, it's very unlikely that this child will be, you know, a healthy, per, uh, or this fetus will be a healthy, uh, grow into a healthy child. You know, you have many options and one of them is abortion. Abortion comes into play here, uh, when people decide to, or when they wouldn't, or if there's any danger to the child or the, 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 the mother. There's a whole aspect on on that piece there. So, where do you feel where people feel this is this moral kind of disgust of you shouldn't do this, and if you do it, you're this kind of person, just a horrible human being for making these types of decisions based on you know predisposed genetic inheritance or things like that. How, how do we how do we understand or wrap our minds around these issues here? If you look at uh, polling, like a public perception things have changed over time. So it used to be that people were wary even, I think of like, I don't know what the public polling would have said about something like screening for breast cancer, but certainly I think that would be very uh, commonly accepted now. But where people get, I think, I don't know if it's a moral disgust or um, if it's just outrage about inequality. I think a lot of different things play a role here, uh, but many people would be in favor of using a health index to select embryos. And that is indeed why genomic prediction uh, only does health screening. Although they will give you the full genotype of your of your embryos and you can do whatever you want with that information. You can actually put it through alter, through another calculator and get other um, polygenic risk scores for other characteristics. Now, where people get wary or people get upset is things like, okay, I wanna choose a child that's taller I want to choose a child that has a certain eye color, or I want to choose a child that has a certain likelihood of educational attainment or IQ. That's where things get dicey in terms of what people think is acceptable. So that's one aspect of it where there's a huge group of people who say, okay, that's, that's like consumer eugenics, but it's an individual's choice to do that. Um, whereas other people will say that actually changes the relationship between parents and offspring. Part of the relationship between parents and offspring is that your kids are not commodities. That you should just love your kids however they come out and that you shouldn't choose kids for a specific reason. There's also, I mean, in this article, I talk about a bunch of other things like, you know, people talking about how parents are exploited, which the people who use the service are really highly educated, like Simone and Malcolm, who did their own calculations on their embryos. They're very highly educated and they know how likely things are to turn out. Okay. For many people, they wouldn't call any of this stuff eugenics because it's individual choices. Again, it doesn't make any sense to say this isn't eugenics because Galton, who coined the term eugenics, wanted to just have a society that had a consciousness about the genetic uh, contribution to behavior and that a society that encouraged people who were highly gifted to have children. Mm. Uh, because they were likely to pass on uh, good qualities onto their children. Then there's a whole kind of fuzzy boundary with governments and what governments do and don't do. So in my, you're probably a Genesis piece, 
I talk about um, bans on sibling marriage and bans on cousin marriage. Mm -hmm. And bans on sibling marriage and cousin marriage are patently eugenic, right? We don't want siblings to have kids together because they're likely to have genetic problems because inbreeding can cause serious problems. And we don't want cousins to have children potentially for the same reason is because they have a double the rate of birth defects in their offspring, especially if you look at something like iterated cousin marriage. But again, when people are familiar with a certain prohibition, like uh, the prohibition on sibling marriage, and people are naturally disgusted by sibling marriage. So they're more disgusted by sibling marriage than they are by it being eugenics. Mm -hmm. That's an interesting, that's why I use that as an example. Mm -hmm. Um, And oftentimes people are more disgusted by cousin marriage than they are by um, the concept of eugenics. Although obviously there's communities all over the world, you know, in Afghanistan, 50% of marriages are between first cousins. In Pakistan, it's a similar uh, percentage. So that's another fuzzy boundary. And I talk about how um, I've been pregnant twice in the last two years. And there's a lot of prenatal testing that you go through. And a lot of this has to do with um, the government or medical bodies that are partly government are saying, they don't ask me what kinds of testing that I want. They recommend such testing. Insurance covers it. Similarly to you know places like Denmark, where um, there is pretty advanced prenatal testing that's typically done for all women, and the tacit foundation of this is that if you want to so-called terminate for medical reasons, you can. And even though that's an individual choice it is a government facilitated form of eugenics that most people, especially progressives agree with. So, you know, in these, in these, especially in the, you're probably eugenicist piece, which I have to do a follow on uh, from, because even if you ask people, you know, should the government incentivize certain people to reproduce and certain people not to reproduce, which by almost any uh, definition is eugenics, People are often in, in favor of that. There's a, a, a nonprofit out of California called Project Prevention that pays women to go on birth control who are addicted to drugs or alcohol. Um, people on average think that that's fine. Is, is it, so I guess the, the question I'm having here on this is, is it the fact that people are okay with these you know, kind of modern genetics and kind of like what you're just saying in, in these ways, because, well, these things are preventative. So that's different than this consumer kind of thing, right? Where it's like, it's not like you go into a store and you say, I'm going to take, I want that embryo. No, I don't want that one. Let, let's mix it up and put these features and let's give them an IQ of 120 maybe. And let's make sure that they're six, eight. And that, you know, this, it's not, that's different than we don't want you to have Parkinson's, or we don't want you to be, have down syndrome or, you know, so is that kind of, is the argument from other people going to say, yeah, that's why we're okay with it. Because if we can see that you're going to have very likely a physical or mental disability, of course, we don't want people to, if you know, knowledge is power, all that stuff. And you, and you have that aspect and you do it anyways, well, then that's a, that's a big uh, strain on the family and or uh, you know the government or the state or whatever. And so that's acceptable. Is it do you feel like that's where the pushback is? It's more of the kind of uh, the latter where people are saying like, well, you know, I want my my kid to be uh, this gender or I want them to have these uh, characteristics or maybe even behavioral characteristics. Is that more where people are kind of resistant to it as opposed to not having uh, disorders or deficits or genetic you know, disorders, things like that? Yeah, I think people have a problem with even like sex selection. Like if you look at Europe, mm-hmm. um, th- America, you can sex, you can ch- select the sex of your offspring. In Europe, interestingly, you're not allowed to sec- select the sex of your offspring. So for example... As insurance against potential infertility, I did a uh, an embryo cycle with Jeffrey in the UK. So we have two embryos in the UK, mm-hmm. right? We're going to have two daughters soon. If I say wanted to go to the UK and have a son, mm-hmm. 
-hmm. they wouldn't let me pick the embryo that was a boy to implant because of sex selection. Yeah. But if I got pregnant, interesting, I got, I got pregnant and then I had a scan and I found out that I was pregnant with a girl and I had an abortion. That's fine. So sex selective abortion is fine. Although they don't ask you why you're having an abortion. Uh-huh. So I, I could, I could go somewhere, have an abortion. Um, if I was to say to the person at the clinic, I'm aborting this baby because it's a girl. I think technically that would not be allowed, but mm-hmm. nobody would, nobody, nobody would said. prevent me from having one. Right. Um, Interesting. Another, there's a bunch, there's a bunch of weird stuff. Like if you look at bioethics, it's a complete mess. There's a way of sorting sperm such that you can mm-hmm. have only girl embryos or only, or 80% girl embryos or 80% boy embryos. That's also not allowed in the United States. You have to go to Mexico for that. Really? Yeah. So sperm so, but there, sorting. But, but there's there's no there's no there's no continuity here. It's just, it is all over the place. But 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 is there the there's there's no reason behind it why? I, don't know. I I've, I have no idea why sperm sorting is illegal in this country. No idea at all. Um, anyway, even though selecting a specific embryo of, that's a boy or a girl is is legal. Uh, yeah. So people have different different criteria. Um, well, something that you kind of dipped into that I, I need to spell out is that mm-hmm. there's a big difference between gene editing and polygenic screening. Yeah, right? yeah. T- 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 say the difference, yeah. sir. So, so, you know, in the future, it is possible that you could do some kind of CRISPR gene editing on embryos mm-hmm. and uh, change them in, in different ways. Right now, that's very dangerous mm-hmm. because there are off-target mutations that happen and you could end up with kids that have all kinds of strange problems. So the famous case of this what well, the Chinese scientist called He, who apparently made a pair of twin girls mm-hmm. immune to HIV by changing, by, by um, crispering a mutation into them and then implanting them into a, a woman. Um, Adam Rutherford in his book goes on and on about this and I've read other, other treatments of it. I don't think that anybody knows exactly what happened to these little girls. Like if they're fine, if they were born, if they're how old mm-hmm. they are, whatever. Mm-hmm. I think we're not sure. Apparently, that's also a mutation that has some positive. It's polygenic, mm-hmm. or like it's pleiotropic. It has got some positive impact on IQ as well. I'm not sure. Mm-hmm. So, if you have ten embryos and you're doing polygenic screening, you can choose uh, an embryo on the basis of certain criteria, but you can't decide like I would like an embryo that's six, eight, that's an IQ of 140. Mm-hmm. Um, one interesting thing about polygenic screening is that on average, good things are packaged together. So on average, uh, the healthiest embryo is also going to be one of the smarter embryos. You don't usually have to trade off between things like, and this is one thing that people get confused about. They're like, oh, you know, what if I can choose a child that it's going to have cancer, but it's the smartest one. Or what if I choose the one that's like least likely to be depressed, but it's also has the lowest IQ. In general, mental, physical, health, um, intelligence, um, all go together. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a um, synchronistic uh, pleiotropy is what it's called. So another thing that you alluded to is like the differences between enhancements and reducing disability. Mm-hmm. And this is another kind of fuzzy line, right? Um, the average size of uh, a, a pygmy in the Congo, I think is like 4'8 or 4'10, mm-hmm. which is by American standards, a little person. Mm-hmm. But that's like the average, that's the average height there. If everybody was enhanced in some way uh, and had an IQ of 130, then IQ of 100 would be considered cognitively disabled, right? So what's considered a deficit or a disability is contingent on what the population averages are. And this is a, it's quite another fuzzy line. There's this great literature about how um, Southerners for hundreds of years or decades or whatever were considered slower and lazier than the Northern counterparts. Why? Because they were all infected with hookworm. Mm. And so um, there's this guy called Nick Bostrom, who's a philosopher and mm-hmm. um, researcher. And, and he's talked about stuff like this as well. It's like, you know, what if we found out that there was some something in the water and that we could remove it and everybody would be uh, have 10 IQ points? Would that really be different than 
enhancing everyone's IQ by 10 points. I don't think if you change somebody's IQ by 10 points, it makes a massive difference. For example, if somebody has an IQ of 95 and then they go to an IQ of 104 in terms of full scale IQ, you're still in the average range. And it doesn't make Mm -hmm. a, it doesn't make a massive difference. Even if you go from, you know, uh, you know, 75 to 85, it's like, okay, you go from, you know, borderline to above average or below average or whatever. It's not Mm going to, it's not going to present as terribly differently. It depends. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I think, but I don't know, maybe if you had like 20 points or something or 15 points, I think it usually goes within standard deviations. But what was Bostrom's kind of point with this, though? He was saying that like, oh, if we called, could change it. It's called the reversal test. Uh-huh. So he says this is a good way of it. And I use the reversal test in my um, eugenics article. So one idea that disability scholars promote is that uh, we should not prevent disabled people from existing because if we prevent disabled people from existing, it's going to change attitudes. It's going to, you know, actually it's called the social model of disability, which is disability is socially constructed. And we only see disabled people as disabled in part because they're rare and because they need special accommodations. If these accommodations were widely available, then they wouldn't be considered disabled as such. Um, And we shouldn't prevent people with disabilities from existing because it's going to change society's attitudes, which is what the foundation of disability is itself. And and the point that I make is essentially, um, if we want more disabled people to exist, that's the reversal test. So if it's wrong to prevent disabled people from existing, then it should be right to promote the existence of disabled people, which would be done all kinds of different ways. Um, Not having people wear seatbelts or encouraging people to do drugs while they're pregnant, that would make more disabled people. I guess, yeah, I was thinking about that when you were saying um, about the, uh, about one of the points, I forget which it was, was I, I wonder if like, for example, if we could find a way where we say, okay, you know, we know that this person, this, this fetus could potentially have um, Down syndrome, let's say, mm-hmm. and we can, we can, um, you know, let's say there's a, the technology there to fix that. We can make sure it, we can change that. Um, or in this case, you could choose to abort the fetus, et cetera, because you know that you know. I think the I think what makes that difficult is kind of what you're saying here for people is we already have you know healthy numbers of people in the United States and around maybe around the world that have Down syndrome or that have you know autism or they have you know other types of developmental disorders. And you know, the thing is, we say, you know, they're still a person, they have deficits, but we try to treat them well and we give them accommodations, et cetera. I think I could see some of the elements of those arguments of, hmm, if we're now opting out of these things, how does the treatment of people that still, that we still, that still live on the planet have those, how would we treat that, those folks mm-hmm. differently and further? You know, what would that, what would a society look like without that? Which is a hard thing, right? Because it's like, well, obviously people don't in a, in a, in a, in a kind of, um, I guess, perfect world or a sanitized world, nobody becomes, you know, uh, pregnant and says, yes, I want my, my, my fetus or potential child to have disabilities. Like nobody wants that to happen. Um, if it does, then they adapt and they deal with it. And I don't know if they love their child any less than a you know neurotypical or a typical child. But I think that's where it kind of feels morally fuzzy because it's like, well, we do know what that's like. And we have lived with folks like, that have various disabilities. So how do we, if we have the power or the ability to not make that happen in the future with technology, <laughs> I guess it's, that's a hard thing because we've lived with folks that, that do, and I can understand that, but I, I do understand the other side of like, yeah, optimally people don't want to have disabilities of any sort. I don't think. Um, so I don't know. I, I, do you see like the kind of like I, I, wrestling I, I of see, it? I could, I could try and sort of steel man the position mm-hmm. that if you have a, a variety of aptitudes, abilities, disabilities, people who are deaf, people who are blind, people who have autism, people who have Down syndrome, that it's going to somehow cultivate a society that's more 
gentle, that's less capitalistic, that uh, assesses people way less on their productivity. I, I think if you look at the most of the people who endorse this kind of view, this, this the disability rights uh, kind of view, it is people who are sort of socialist or, or communist kind of inclined mm -hmm. because they want to see greater redistribution and they see this attitude towards redistribution as tied up in people who are, you know, in, in visible, vulnerable people who society cares for. And they think a society in which we, we have to care for people is uh, a much better and more valuable society in than, than one in which um, everybody is as uh, competent able-bodied and, and healthy, mm -hmm. uh, as possible, uh, or, or where the vast majority are, of course, th there's a trade-off with this, right. Where, uh, like in places like Denmark and Israel, uh, which have these socialized medicine regimes, it makes sense for the government, um, to encourage, for example, um, prenatal testing because somebody with Down syndrome is going to cost more money than they put into the system. And so maybe having more people with Down syndrome means that society has got a more caring attitude towards these people. But the more people with Down syndrome you have, the less resources there are for each individual person mm -hmm. in terms of, of, of government resources. Or um, And so this is another thing that I say in the, the, the eugenics piece is that in societies where we see uh, prenatal testing or, or in Denmark where they actually have uh, subsidized IVF and where Denmark is also the place where I know some people have considered getting sperm donation because you get the most information about sperm donors in Denmark than anywhere else on earth. So you can actually make the most eugenic choices about who's going to be your sperm donor compared to, for example, the UK, uh, where you get much less information about your about your donor. They also have very generous allowances for um, people who are disabled. Uh, you know, if you have a Down syndrome child in Denmark, uh, you get special shoes, you get special he health care. And of course, it also has to do with it being a, a wealthy uh, country. Yeah. I mean, Whereas, yeah. yeah small population, hom homogenized, they have a whole yeah. say, safety net system. I mean, it's right. I mean, you, yeah, you can kind of, you know, it's wealthy. I mean, you can kind of. It makes sense for other countries that aren't that way. Well, it's much, <laughs> it's, it, there's, it's much different. It's, it's much more negative, I would think. But I mean, there, there's really anti-eugenic policies in, in Poland mm. and those anti-eugenic policies are really tied up in, in religiosity. So yeah. in Poland, um, up until recently, you could have an abortion, uh, but they were actually paying women, even women whose kids were supposed to die very soon after birth, children that had really terrible chromosomal anomalies mm. where they would be expected to live hours or maybe days after birth. You know, in the States, there are birthing, there are places where you can give birth to children like that, like special places where it's like a hospice and a birthing center all in one. Mm. Uh, the Polish government was incentivizing women to give birth to these children rather than aborting them, I think, to the tune of a thousand euros. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Um, and so, it, but it got too expensive. Uh, this is a bunch of disability rights advocates in Poland were saying that uh, if you have a disabled child in Poland, you actually don't get that much in terms mm. of, it's just a much poorer country than Denmark. Yeah. 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 So I guess yeah, on, on, that, on that side of things, I mean, wh wh where's your position on this, I guess, like in terms of kind of like with my, my moral quandary there of like, well, you know, if we're able to, 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 figure these things out, you know, prenatally and, and kind of, you know, in utero, should, should we, should we do it or should we not do it? Should we, is that too much playing God or whatever? Like, how do you, I mean, where do you fall on this? I guess, right. If we don't have any more disabled people in society, like how, how is that going to change? Or I don't know. I don't what do think you think? It's going to happen because, because, because America is quite religious. So people mm -hmm. I think are still going to have disabled children for religious reasons. Mm -hmm. I think the United States has more down syndrome children than most other places like in Western Europe, yeah. even though it's also very funny about how uh, loose the United States is in terms of bioethics, um, polygenic screening, as I talk about in my essay is legal in the United States. Nobody wants to regulate it here in the UK. 
I think you're going to have to go to some kind of tribunal if you want to do polygenic screening, mm. uh, some kind of uh, human fertility and embryo authority council that'll tell you whether or not you can choose an embryo that has specific qualities or not. Um, even though in the UK, um, fewer women have children with Down syndrome. Okay. So, yeah. Um, my, my personal view, if I was like, you know, queen of a country, uh, I'm quite libertarian in orientation. So I would never have like a central authority that would sterilize people or not sterilize people or whatever on the basis of um, their their qualities. But I, I do think that it would be good to have some incentives in place for people who have good qualities to reproduce. So right now, the smartest women in our society are not specifically incentivized to, to have children. Mm. And they often have fewer children uh, than, than women who are, are less educated. So for example, Lee Kuan Yew in Singapore developed these like matchmaking cruises because he wanted men who were college educated to get together with women who were college educated rather than women who weren't college educated. And also he offered things like incentives of like free childcare for women who were college educated. Of course, being college educated in Singapore is different because not everybody, it's like in the United States, like everybody's, you know, almost anybody can go to college if they really want to. Mm -hmm. Whereas in Singapore, the criteria are much more stringent. Mm -hmm. um, it's, you know, very easy to implement eugenic policy is to just help people who don't want to have children, not have children and help people who do want to have children, have children. Mm -hmm. So if you are addicted to drugs or alcohol, not only is it not a great idea for you to have kids because you're unlikely to be able to care for them, they're going to end up in the hospital, in the foster care system, and they're going to end up with whatever mental illness mm -hmm. or substance abuse problems that you have because those things are genetically passed on. You also probably don't want to have kids. Like, mm -hmm. I don't know a, a woman who is a, a heroin addict who lives on the street who's like, you know what I really want right now as a child. Mm -hmm. And so to me, one of the most puzzling things is to be against some kind of government uh, program or even a nonprofit program that says, you know what, we're going to help you actualize this preference, right? And if you took women who were, you know, university educated, this is, if you look like maternity leave policies and things like that, they actually don't tend to do very much to help women have more kids who are high powered women. Like in Sweden and other places, um, if you give women more maternity leave, it usually actually doesn't improve their likelihood of having kids, it has increased the birth rate. Um, but to specifically give people incentives, I think that's, that's totally allowable. And it's just helping people do what they want to do. So I would be against any policy that, um, you know, even if somebody with Huntington's disease wants to, um, to have kids without testing, mm -hmm. whether they themselves are, uh, um, w whether their children have it or not, um, that is much more damaging than cousin marriage or even sibling marriage and, and reproduction. Mm -hmm. uh, and yet we don't do anything about that. So for me, it would just be about weighing up the costs and benefits against the individual volition of people. And I think you'd have to be very careful with undermining anybody's uh, desire to, or to have, or to, to not have kids. So anything that's like, you know, some people would say paying a heroin addict to get an IUD, which is a mm -hmm. uh, non-hormonal form of birth control, is coercive. You could take out an IUD by yourself with your fingers in 15 minutes. <laughs> it's not sterilization. It's not, it's, it's, it's like not hard to do. So I just don't think that that's a big deal. Um, you know, even in, in like, if you look at Adam Rutherford's control, he, mm -hmm. he calls an IUD sterilization. It's not sterilization. Anything you could reverse in 15 minutes is not sterilization. Mm. Uh, but in any case, that's where I would draw the line is, and I think that we could do a huge amount of good um, and, you know, reduce disease burden in ways that I think people are in favor of. And, you know, if you look at environmental interventions, um, just by pushing on open doors, that is helping people do what they want to do, helping people who don't want to have kids, not have kids, helping people who do want to have kids, T to, to give people incentives, like, people talk about welfare system to give people uh, an incentive to have more children who cannot care for the children that they have. That's wrong. I think from both a genetic, if you look at a eugenic kind of, uh, of attitude, but also even if you look at environmental uh, kinds of attitudes, like, 
if people, uh, you know, wealthier people, uh, people who have means, their kids tend to do better for whatever reason. You could say it's environmental or you can say it's genetic if you want to. It doesn't make sense um, to incentivize people who whose children are going to be worse off on average um, to have kids. It's a, it's a tricky thing. I hear the argument. I guess my thing is my 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 pushback for for most of my libertarian friends is always yes people should be within the right to choose what they want to do and have freedom most mm-hmm. people make fucking terrible decisions for themselves and for other people mm-hmm. and in the united states someone's got to deal with it even if they can't even if they don't the state does or other people do and this is where people get upset because it's like well you know, yes, you have the freedom to make your choices, but if you're not responsible for your choices, then somebody is going to be responsible. And you know, the state or the 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 country or the county or that that you know that's a that's more of a, a pressure point. And then other people are taking care of somebody else's irresponsible free choice. And so then it becomes well. Now, I'm not saying the 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 solution is you know the state you know tells you what to do and how to do this or not do that. I think it's a it's a it's a contentious kind of give and take of like okay, yes, you should be able to make your own choices. However, what are the consequences of some of those choices if you do or don't do certain things? And I think that's where it becomes tricky to say how do you have federal policies. Um, or local policies, and or how do you have things that are completely a, a, a private entity where people are able to do it all on their own? But I just think most people, or a lot of people, make terrible choices, terrible, terrible, terrible choices that then have an impact on on the rest of others around them. And it's like, well, then how do we how do we deal with that then? Which is a it's always what is the the the. <laughs> The pushback that I always have with my libertarian friends. I, mean, like, I like I like the American system. I mean, I, I think that less federal oversight and more regional, mm-hmm. provincial, whatever Confederate kind of oversight is better because then we get more experimentation and people can vote with their feet and they can go places that they want to go. And if mm-hmm. you know, if a state wants to make it illegal to have abortions or to get gender care or to do polygenic screening, which those things kind of come as a package because that's conservative. We could see how that state does in in 20 or 50 years, right? Compared to a state that doesn't do that. And people Mm -hmm. can, uh, can live places that enact their values. Mm -hmm. I think that that, that makes sense. And I know that people can't just kind of go wherever they want to go. But I still think that the the value of experimentation, like social experiments, mm-hmm. is huge. And I wouldn't want to see the same policy, even if I thought it was a good policy, necessarily sure. enacted everywhere, mm-hmm. because then we'll, we'll never know what, what, you know what the trade-offs are. Mm-hmm. Um, similar to, um, there's this paper, uh, Donahue and, and Levitt, uh, about uh, where abortion has been legalized. Um, have you seen this, uh, abortion reduces crime? Mm-mm. No, I haven't. It's in Freakonomics. It's in other places, but um, the abortion reduces crime idea is that when you legalize abortion, people who have unplanned pregnancies are more likely to have abortions. On average, somebody who has an unplanned pregnancy is more likely to have a child that's going to become a criminal in the future. Interesting. And so, what we see is a decrease in crime. I mean, they basically say that this is the, the legalization of abortion. Um, as well as deletting, so those two things together mm-hmm. are responsible for the decrease in crime that we saw in the uh, '90s and 2000s in the United States. Mm. Um, there's this very controversial view. They say it's because because they don't want to give in a genetic explanation because that's kind of taboo. They mm-hmm. say it's because uh, of quote unquote unwantedness, right? Mm. Being an unwanted child predisposes you to criminality. Mm. I would say something different, mm. but. Uh, This is the kind of thing where I would say that if you, if you get pregnant on accident, um, or if you get pregnant through a a casual relationship, if you're a woman who would choose to have an abortion, uh, there's a variety of reasons why women choose abortion. One of those is that 
she doesn't have the means or another one is because the father of that child has decided not to stick around. They're not in a relationship anymore. Those are major reasons. Those things have genetic correlates, right? Mm -hmm. Not having the means to have a child is correlated. uh, And also accidentally getting pregnant is correlated with lack of self-control. No offense to anybody who's accidentally gotten pregnant. (laughs) It happens all the time. Mm -hmm. Um, But people who accidentally get pregnant are different than people who don't accidentally get pregnant. Genetically, they're different. So what if you had, what if you had some, sorry, what if you had some, I mean, again, I don't want to do anecdotal stuff, but what if you had someone that had two different types of pregnancies an unplanned and a planned pregnancy, Mm -hmm. how, how would that work then where it's like, (laughs) would on average, the two kids then just have potentially different outcomes just based on, well, at one stage, the pregnancy was unplanned. And then, you know, the other stage when they were a little bit older, they had the second kid and that was more planned or it was planned. And so are those two kids? if they have the same father, of course, uh-huh. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's say, let's say, the same, let's, let's say it's yeah. the same father. Yeah. The same, then, then, yeah, you could also assume that that would be in totally environmental, right? That mm-hmm. would be you have the same people with the same genes with a planned pregnancy, mm-hmm. same people, with same genes, unplanned pregnancy. In one case, they probably are more likely to have means mm-hmm. to take care of that child and uh, raise that child as well as they can, um, as opposed to the other the other scenario. I think that legalized abortion and people disagree with me on this all the time, but I think legalized abortion is that kind of, it's a eugenic policy Mm -hmm. that um, just helps people actualize their preferences. Mm -hmm. And there's tons of stuff like that. You you don't actually have to do things that people don't want uh, to enact eugenic policy. There's tons of eugenic policy. Like um, that would be, that would be very easy uh, to implement. And that wouldn't actually go against anybody's, or that wouldn't be coercive in any way. Mm-hmm. I mean, for me, I think it's not coercive to offer somebody a small amount of money to to get on contraceptives. Somebody who doesn't yeah. have the means to to take take care of a child, mm-hmm. and I don't think it's um, coercive either to give somebody uh, access to free prenatal care or to free prenatal testing, which is also eugenic. Mm-hmm. I guess, what do you think, I guess the, I mean, it's kind of hard to say with some of this stuff, but I mean, where do you find the future of this stuff is going? We have uh, genetic testing, we have polygenetic, you know, kind of screenings, we have, we have all this stuff. You talked about the different uh, jurisdictions, both in, in, in uh, Europe and here in the US, and it's all over the place. Where, where do you, I guess, see scientifically and then I guess more socially or culturally the conversation goes with, with these, like with IVF, with the genetic, type, polygenetic, all these things, you know, prenatally. And then afterwards, where do you, where do you think this kind of plays out? Polygenic screening is going to get better right now. You can account for some small percent of the variance between embryos with polygenic screening, apparently the models are going to get better. One other problem with polygenic screening, as I alluded to before, is it works better for white people Mm -hmm. than black people, Jewish people, or East Asian people, although Jewish Jewish people works fine. So those are all uh, considerations. And, you know, as those models get better, people are going to use them more. There's two different views on this. One is that it doesn't work at all. So these people are just wasting their money. Another is that it's going to work very well and it's going to cause greater inequality. If we start to see it working, like if my friends, you know, Simone and Malcolm Collins, who are going to have, I don't know, as many kids as they can, let's say they have eight kids and the first two that they chose at random are very different in quality than the ones that they chose with polygenic screening later on, people are going to see, you know, the difference and they're going to clamor for this technology. And there's possibly even going to be some appetite for the government to subsidize this Mm -hmm. technology for people who are disadvantaged or marginalized, right? Uh, For people with disabilities or for people with other kinds of of problems. So I do see that's a a potential, um, you know, it's got a similar... I hate the word vibe, so I'm not going to use it. (laughs) It reminds me of affirmative action, but an affirmative action that might actually work as Mm. opposed to an affirmative action that that won't work, where you would actually, the government would give people who are really poor 
um, access, free access to this kind of uh, technology. So that's that's one possibility. You know, I, I talk about in my piece that Eric Turkheimer, who mm-hmm. doesn't think that these these models are terribly predictive, yeah. thinks people are just going to waste their money on it mm-hmm. and then they're going to end up losing interest. I think the models are going to get better and that there's going to be more interest and that there's going to be governments like in Israel and Denmark that actually subsidize this technology. Um, it, Steve Sue who is the founder of genomic prediction has also said in his podcast manifold uh, that he thinks that China will subsidize this technology mm-hmm. and make it cheaper and easier to use because China is going to subsidize IVF to try to increase their, um, their birth rate. Yeah. In terms of um, behavioral but, genetics. Before ahead. you get there, before you get there, I have one question at, at the moment, what is the kind of contours of um, um, uh, polygenetic uh, screening? Uh, so what is it, I guess, looking at, at the moment, you know, prenatally? So what can it, it can look for various disorders that someone can have. I mean, there's, yeah, there's what I remember it was, you know, 16 years ago, but <laughs> I don't know what it is now. What, what, what is like, yeah. how, how, what's the extent of it as to what it can look at uh, or, or, or consider for, for people? So there's like a, there's there's something called genome wide association studies. They look at a variety of alleles and they give you like a, a risk score, and that risk score can predict various things about you um, with varying degrees of accuracy. So things like height, educational attainment, mental health, and physical health, mm-hmm. right? And so you might not be guaranteed a specific like IQ outcome. This is the the point that. Adam Rutherford and control harps on a lot, but let's say I have 10 embryos. There's an 80% chance that using polygenic screening, I could pick the tallest one or mm. the one that has the, the greatest genetic possibility of um, high educational attainment. IQ is, is trickier for a variety of, of reasons. Mm-hmm. Um, with uh, Simone and Malcolm, they actually primarily chose their daughter Um, because she had the lowest risk of certain bad health outcomes, one of which took her grandmother's life, this cancer, right? Um, These are population-based studies. There aren't any guarantees about these uh, these particular outcomes. So as I said, that there's there's a lot of uncertainty. That doesn't mean that this technology is necessarily exploitative. It just means that and I took go on about this at length in the in the piece that I wrote, um, embryo selection, healthy babies versus bad arguments, is that we're always trading off uncertain sure. outcomes mm-hmm. um, when we decide what to do uh, with our with our kids. Um, yeah, mm. yeah, because I, I know that sometimes you can look for certain types of disorders, but I'm assuming over time it just becomes more and more and more. Is more likely this person is cancer or any kind of. Um, uh, autoimmune or maybe neurodegenerative disorders, things like that. And it only continues to increase, right? The more, the more it has population kinds of, uh, studies you're able to show like, okay, well, it's more likely, again, there's trade-offs that, you know, we can cast a bigger net to, to see more of the possibilities that could be there. Right. As opposed to just like, is this person going to have Huntington's or not have Huntington's? It gets, it continues to expand, right? Yeah. One of the limitations right now is that we don't know like about rare variants so there are mm-hmm. potentially rare variants like back uh i don't know how many decades ago there's a family in scotland and none of them can articulate right or use grammar i can't remember exactly what was wrong with them and they mm-hmm. found out that they have a mutation on this fox p2 gene mm-hmm. so that's a deficit not an aptitude but mm-hmm. these people have a rare variant and so there are potentially other rare variants like you could see a, a, a family where everyone has perfect pitch right but you wouldn't be able to predict their, you know, which embryo would be most likely to be musical because mm-hmm. that's a rare variant. And we're using these mm-hmm. genome wide association studies of large populations and common genetic variants. Mm-hmm. So this rare genetic variant stuff, uh, if this research comes to fruition, it could be that we, you know, are able to, um, to figure out rare genetic variants. You know, if you look at, Things like in the United States, like I've been an egg donor many times, mm-hmm. mostly in the UK, I've been an egg donor, but there was an egg donor advertisement. Um, I knew a young woman who was at a, she actually qualified, but she didn't do it. They wanted a, a woman who was over five, eight, who was a runner and who had red hair and who was musical. It's very specific. She could have gotten paid. I want to say like $150,000 for her eggs because wow. they were looking for this like wow. really unusual uh, phenotype. Uh-huh. 
And so that's still the kind of thing that you could, that's totally legal to do if you want to. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's the kind of thing where you, where you could get to get, you know, get a, a, a rare um, phenotype. And there's, there's other things like, so in the future, it might be possible to make gametes with skin cells. So instead mm-hmm. of having to harvest somebody's gametes the old fashioned way wow. with ovarian stimulation or jerking off into a cup, mm-hmm. you instead will be able to make gametes. And this is a problem the religious people have. Obviously, if you make hundreds of embryos and you right. toss toss all the ones that you don't want, for some yeah. people, right. that's hundreds of souls. Right. For other people, that's just clumps of cells. Right. So these are the kinds of things that we're going to have to grapple with. But uh, you know, if if I could uh, make a hundred embryos with some novel technology, then you could pick one that has quite an unusual uh, characteristic. And that's really that's actually, um, I think. The plot of Gattaca. I'm not sure exactly what the technology is in Gattaca, but yeah, yeah. something like that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's true. Yeah, it's it's interesting. I mean, like, you know, I was supposed to be six three six four. Um, I'm not six three six four. Um, I'm I'm, I'm five nine. <laughs> um, but but part of it was I just have more. I have worse scoliosis than than the average kind of adolescent does. Most adolescents oh, have about like five degrees or curvature of the spine. Mine's 30, 30 degrees. Um, I'm barely five feet tall. Everyone over five eight is the same to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, but that's the point, though, right? Like in that scenario, like let's say you know the the best you know embryo was selected, and you know for the most part, you know again, there's things with the environment, but you know this person is going to be six three, six four. Does it really matter in terms of everything else for the person's life on average, whether they're five nine, five ten, or they're six three, six four? Probably not. Right. I think that there's maybe for some people, or maybe there might be some advantages or disadvantages, but I think for men, height is quite a big advantage. Although I don't quite personally identify with that very much because I'm a short woman and my brother's short. And I don't, I really don't know. Care. I mean, but I, yeah. I know there's, I know there's some, some I know research that, on that, but yeah. I, I, I still kind of like, yes. And I, I feel like that becomes more as, as we have people with, with varying heights, I think it becomes more of like, like, yes, back in George Washington's time. Yeah. He was a giant and it was like sort of leadership and power and like, but I wonder if now there's more people in the heights of more varied, if that's still kind of the case. I mean, on average, yes. If someone's going to have much more advantages, if you're a man that's five ten as opposed to five, three, for sure. Yeah. But, being attractive know. is, is hugely. Yeah. Yeah. It has huge um, advantages. And as far as I know, although I haven't talked to any experts on this in particular, um, you know, you could choose like the lightest skin embryo, or you could choose the embryo that's most likely to have blue eyes or whatever, but mm-hmm. those things are not like universally considered attractive, right? Mm-hmm. There's tons mm-hmm. of brown eyed people or better looking than blue eyed people, right? Those mm-hmm. things. Mm-hmm. So as far as I know, there's no uh, polygenic score for like being symmetrical mm-hmm. or having typically feminine features or having um, a certain body type that's considered desirable. Mm-hmm. And as depressing as it is to say i think if if you were if if that was available i think that would be the thing most people would be tempted by over iq over yeah maybe even over mental health and maybe even over physical health is to have the most beautiful child they could yeah it's it's, that's the same that's the thing that people are still trying to figure out is they want to know how they can live longer and they can look as young as possible right and other things that everyone kind of generally wants right they don't want to get old they don't want to look old but they want to live forever you know there's a lot of things that people kind of want as a kind of fantasy of sorts. Uh, yeah. I guess the, the, the last the thing I'll, I'll ask you here is, you know, obviously with, with eugenics, you know, you're trying to, you know, reclaim it of sorts and, and, and bumping into a lot of people that are kind of pissed off about it, which I guess you can get from its history. But I think if, you know, people hear how you make the arguments, I think it's pretty clear that you're not for, you know, Nazi science. Um, <laughs> I mean, this is this is the, this we were really deep in this interview, and if people are still here, um, the Nazis killed the highest productivity people in their society, right? Yes. If you want to do eugenics, killing Jews is the wrong way to do it. Yeah, I mean, wrong way to do it yeah. Although, uh, although people are really offended by this, like the, the Nazis are so dumb they did eugenics wrong and they killed Jews. Like, why would you kill if you were really eugenic? Right. Ashkenazi have incredibly, mm-hmm. um, I mean, sometimes they have health problems, but, mm-hmm. 
I'm, I'm only a quarter Ashkenazi, mm. but yeah, they, they, it doesn't make sense mm-hmm. uh, to kill off the most productive people in your society. Uh, that's not eugenics and mm-hmm. it's stupid to say it is, but carry on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I guess for you, how much of, you know, on, on, on the eugenics thing, on even the polyamorous stuff we talked about, or, or even just with, with, um, kind of the evolutionary stuff, where do you, where do you find that you, your views have evolved, no pun intended, <laughs> evolved or changed on any of these topics? Like wherever it was like your kind of starting point. And as you either have more conversations or you did more research or you, you know, whatever, and then it changed maybe not entirely the opposite direction, but it, it kind of, you know, evolves over time. Where, where, I guess, just kind of where has that happened for you and and what did it take to kind of get you in those spaces? Or is it not? You're just extremely stubborn. You've had the same views for 20 years. <laughs> my views have become sort of more extreme. In part, I studied disgust for a long time and disgust is this irrational emotion. And so when I see people advocating what's called the wisdom of repugnance, right? So for example, somebody might be against organ markets, like against the idea of people selling their kidneys because it's gross Mm -hmm. or against another thing. If you want to, if you want to piss off people on the right, um, I need to write something about this. I think if a man takes hormones to lactate, he makes the same kind of milk that a woman does. That's what the evidence shows. But like trans women lactating for babies mm-hmm. makes people's heads explode because it's mm-hmm. gross to the vast majority of, of people. Mm-hmm. So the more I look at the wisdom of repugnance, it's very frustrating to me when people make arguments that they can't rationally back up just because mm-hmm. they're grossed out, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. And so I think in some ways I've become more stubborn and pushed back on that more mm-hmm. because the wisdom of repugnance is so illegitimate uh, to me. In fact, um, I, I have I've, I've I've had some interesting conversations with with Bo Weingard, who is much more disgust sensitive than me, and who thinks it's it's a good idea to accept the wisdom of repugnance, uh, and I don't. Mm-hmm. Um, so, if you look at stuff like um, Jonathan Haidt's stuff on like moral dumbfounding, yeah. you see it everywhere, mm-hmm. and. I I sort of delight in in morally dumbfounding people, and maybe that's become more extreme. But I, I have more of the you know as I get older and have more experiences or whatever, mm-hmm. I have more of the courage of my convictions. But it's not just the courage of my convictions. I look at somebody like you know my friend Justin Murphy or Brian Kaplan, um, people who are fearlessly putting ideas out into the public because what's the worst that can happen? Mm-hmm. Somebody can say you're full of shit or that you're wrong. Right. And uh, if somebody makes a good argument against me, I'm I'm happy to hear it. But that's the worst that can happen. It's not really something to be afraid of. Yeah, that's a great way to think of it. I, I have a a similar um, opinion as you, although I'm more uh, <laughs> maybe ambiguous in some ways. Um, I agree. I think we shouldn't be afraid of ideas. And if they are dangerous or if they are tough for us, I think we should, you don't have to believe it. You just have to, I think, respectfully, I think, engage with it and try to make sense of it. And you could disagree and that's fine. And and you could, I think what makes people afraid is what if it's right? Or what if I have to change my opinion? And that's really hard for people. And I, and I can understand that. I can understand why that's hard. I mean, uh, yes, I, I can, I can definitely understand that. So, um, but I, I think it's, I think it's great that, that you, uh, you push on these things and um, you do it in my estimation. Um, you know, I, I don't perceive like your intentions are, are you know, negative or, you know, nefarious. I think you're just trying to understand things. And I think it's, I think that's good. I think it's um, people will do those things just to kind of piss people off. And, you know, eh, sometimes it's fun. To I, I won't say that squirm. I'm never a troll. Like yeah, trolling occasionally it's, it's, is fun. Sometimes and, and, it's yeah, fun to see people squirm a little, but I don't think that's your main intention. Irritating people can be very funny, but no, yeah. I don't, I don't purposefully, I don't engage um, with the sole intention of irritating people. Yeah. I, I hope to irritate people too. An enlightened viewpoint. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Did you consider different, different views? I think that's, that's, that's valuable. 
Well, Diana, this is uh, so much fun. I, I appreciate you giving me your time and your wisdom and your, your energy. Um, I'm sure people can uh, find you uh, online. Is there any place in particular you want I'm, to plug? I'm, I'm one of only four Diana Fleischmans, and the other ones are virtually <laughs> unknown. So just right, Google right. me. You'll yeah. find me. Yeah. Okay, I have good. the biggest public preference of any Diana Fleischman. I'm <laughs> huge compared to other Diana Fleischmans. <laughs> <laughs> well, very wonderful. Uh, thanks so much for, for doing this. I really, really enjoyed it. Thanks for having me. Of course.